Welcome everyone to the third part of our Get to Know the Friends series. Um, we've got two really great young friends with us tonight um, who I will introduce in a minute. Um, my name is Kira Mann and I am the Assistant Coordinator of Programs and Events for Canadian Friends Service Committee who is hosting this event tonight. Um, I just wanna let everyone know that this evening is being okay. recorded um, and that's just for the archives and also for friends who uh, cannot be with us tonight so if you do not want to be recorded please turn off your video um, that would be great I'd also like to start with a land acknowledgement um, so um, I live and work and the CFSC office is located on the traditional territory of the Wendat Putin Nation and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River this land has been the site of human activity for over 15,000 years and is, this, and is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum, a sacred treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek. The people with us tonight are from all across Turtle Island and we acknowledge and respect the people of this land. Um, I'm hoping um, that we can start this evening out with maybe five minutes of silent worship. So if um, there's anybody that's new to Quakerism tonight, if we could just spend five minutes of reflection um, uh, in silence, um, and then we'll get started. So thanks so much, friends.
so much friends um, and thank you for joining us here tonight um i'm just gonna start us off with a few housekeeping items uh, it's the the same spiel i give every time um so i'm sorry for being repetitive but um i just like to ask you to keep yourself muted throughout the speaker's remarks and only unmute yourself if you intend to speak during the uh, during the discussion um, uh, please keep the discussion and the chat a safe and respectful place for everybody. Um, if you're having issues with connectivity, which I think I am, so um, I'm sorry about that, um, try turning off your video um, and that usually helps the connection. If that doesn't work, I'd suggest just leaving the meeting and re-entering. Um, just a reminder for those that have joined us since I mentioned this earlier, that um, this evening is being recorded um, to share with the Quaker archives um, and any friends who were not able to join us tonight. Uh, if you don't want to be recorded, please keep your camera off. Um, and I also wanted to let friends know um, that Rachel and Christina have asked me to share that um, at the bottom of the screen, there's a reactions button. Um, if they're speaking too fast, they um, you can ask them to slow down by clicking the slower button. Um, and you can also let them know what you think of their presentation throughout by um, hitting any of those other reaction buttons. Um, is everybody still hearing me? Can anybody give me the thumbs up or, or just say yes? Um, to make sure that it's okay. My, my internet's a little unstable. Yes, it's good. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and just before we start, I just want to remind folks that um, this series is um, hosted by CFSC and it's uh, done to honor our 90th anniversary, which we're celebrating this year. I'm going to post two links in the chat um, for you. Uh, and oops, let me just copy and paste that right now. Um, if you want more information um, or to learn more about CFSC. And I will post that there. Um, now to the good parts. Um, I'm gonna let um, Rachel and Christina uh, introduce themselves a little more thoroughly. Um, but I just wanna say, um, that I, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Christina very briefly at um, CYM in Prince Edward Island a few years ago. Um, and she is a member of Halifax Monthly Meeting and currently joining us from Livia, um, where she lives and works. Um, and I know she's gonna tell you a bit more about that this evening. So I'll, I'll let her jump into that. Um, and we're also joined by Rachel Singleton Polster, who um, was raised on in Vancouver Island monthly meeting um, and now resides in Vancouver as well, where she's um, living and studying and she will tell you more about that. And I've also had the great opportunity to work with and learn from Rachel. Um, so I know that what he has to say tonight is going to be really interesting. Um, so I will start by passing it right over to Rachel to get us started. Thanks, Kira. Um, so I just want to say that, yes, I'm joining you from Vancouver. I'm Rachel Singleton Polster and Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. And I'll pass it over to Christina for that as well. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm in uh, Tupiago Marca on Aymara land, also known as La Paz uh, here in Bolivia. So I just want to start us off by saying thank you to everyone who is here. It really warms my heart to see you all um, in this online meeting and 
um, just makes me feel, feel so at home to see all of your faces. And I'm looking forward to our question and answer period. Um, I also wanna say thanks to everyone who's gone before us in this service work and in CFSC. And I'm sure we can all think of the amazing friends um, who may have passed on who have done the work of service for friends. Um, also, thanks to Kira and to CFSC for inviting us to present tonight and also for organizing this conversation and bringing you all together. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to share a little bit about our experiences doing service work as young adult friends and how Quakerism has shaped our paths in service work. We will be putting a few questions into the chat throughout, um, which we invite you to join into in, in the chat function. And there's also going to be a little, a little break, a fun break about halfway through, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, so that's kind of the structure layout for this evening, and let's get it started. Um, so Christina, um, maybe you could tell us all a little bit about um, how you were raised in Quakerism and, and how that journey started for you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I want to echo the thanks that Rachel shared. Uh, thanks for speaking on, on behalf of both of us. I'm also really happy to be here tonight. And it's so, so nice to see so many familiar faces and new faces. And um, I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to our sharing the space tonight. Um, so my mother, who many of you may know is Jessica Telez. And I started going to Halifax monthly meeting when I was seven with my mom. And my mom's parents are both from Quaker families. And my grandparents actually met as volunteers with Atlantic, with Atlantic, with American Friends Service Committee in Poland after the Second World War. My grandfather was a birthright Quaker from Indiana, and my grandmother was from a long line of Quakers in Pennsylvania, but she uh, herself wasn't a practicing Quaker. So um, when I started going to Halifax Monthly Meeting, I attended first day school and then slowly started taking part in the meetings for worship as I got older. And um, my mom's family is mostly in Alberta and my dad's family is all here in Bolivia where I am now. So we didn't have any biological family uh, when I was growing up in Halifax. So growing up with the, in the Halifax Quaker community gave me a base of people, community that I knew I could reach out to if I needed anything, a group of older people that I really looked up to and was able to learn from. And um, being part of an intergenerational community from a young age has been really important and, and has really shaped my path. So I'm really grateful to uh, Halifax Monthly Meeting and any members of Halifax Monthly Meeting who are here tonight. Thanks for um, supporting me all the way. Um, I went to, uh, I grew up going to Atlantic Friends gatherings and uh, Canadian yearly meetings when they were in Windsor. And those were really special times for me to meet other young Quakers. Um, and in Halifax, I also got to spend time and uh, was a real privilege to learn from activists like Betty Peterson and Muriel Duckworth, who were members of the Halifax Monthly Meeting. And um, definitely, uh, were some of my first introductions to the Quaker service world. Um, how about you, Rachel? How did your journey with Quakerism start? Yeah, so I was, yeah, I was born into a Quaker family, as, as many of you probably all know. Um, here, my father is David Polster, and my mother is Genevieve Singleton. Um, and I can see my Auntie Celia is here too. Um, and my grandmother is Betty Polster. And so growing up in this Quaker family, I was always familiar with the work of the Canadian Friends Service Committee, especially through uh, my Grammy Betty, who, who served friends uh, in many roles over the years, including with CFSC. And like Christina, the, those gatherings were really crucial to me growing up as a young friend, um, where, you know, the small community that I grew up in, it was my siblings and my cousins were the young friends nearby. And that was, you know, for me, Western half yearly meeting in Sorrento and in the prairies. Um, those were sort of where I was able to form friendships and where my spirituality as a, a young friend was affirmed in a really fun community uh, in one grounded in worship and, and learning from friends in an intergenerational way. 
Um, and similarly, like Christina, um, going to CYM was a really big deal for me. And uh, my Grammy Betty would alternate grandchildren and, and bring us along with her to CYMs. And, and maybe some of you remember little Rachel showing up <laughs> or my siblings or my cousins uh, in that way. And that was a really mind opening experience to me. And yeah, actually that, that takes me to, how did we meet Christina? Where do you recollect that? <laughs> um, we, in preparing for this, we were sort of going back over because it was a long time ago, um, but we did meet for the first time at Canadian Yearly Meeting in Windsor when we were both te early teenagers, I think, early mid-teenagers. Um, and I remember that yearly meeting because it was one of the first times that as a teenager, I was with so many other young friends and being able to be in a, a Canadian Young Friends yearly meeting, uh, meeting for worship for business, mouthful. Um, my first, was um, that was my first introduction to Quaker process and feeling the spirit move in a business meeting. And it, it opened my eyes and my heart to start being curious about what faith could really mean for me in my life and the type of community that I could um, be a part of. And um, I'm wondering for you, Rachel, how was going to see it, CYMs for you? Yeah, I was I was thinking about that that meeting, and there, it, you know, our friendship is just one of the many friendships that I think as young friends that there's that you know and and i think for all of us when we attend these quaker gatherings or even here on zoom we can feel that connection of of our you know shared values and shared faith um and that was really grounding to me as a young person and so i just wanted to note here that i i recollect um having a lot of support from my local meeting um and i wanted to encourage you know of course when COVID is over when and when it's safe um, to encourage all of you to think about how you can encourage um, young friends to access the funds to attend these gatherings, because these are kind of the places where that spirituality is nurtured, like we've been saying, and where, um, you know, as a, a very small faith community, it's very important for young friends to have these gatherings as transformative places that really define the direction of our lives. And thinking about that, I was also thinking about CYM over the years as a place where I learned about the work of the service committee. And I remember being so inspired by some of the presentations of friends who were working in, in service for friends and, and learning about that and also participating in some service work during these gatherings. And I think I just wanted to also say, I think the committee may have changed names now, but it was, I believe, support from HAMAC, um, Home Mission and Advancement Committee, that um, facilitated my being able to attend many of these gatherings over the years. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of um, HAMAC, I believe that I also got support from, or that we both did, uh, got support from HAMAC to go on the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage. And I also, um, what you're mentioning about getting support from your, receiving support from your monthly meeting. I know the Halifax monthly meeting also uh, supported me on going to the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage. Um, so the, the pilgrimage is, was an experience that happened every two or four years. And Rachel and I went on the pilgrimage in 2008. 13 years ago, um, and for three weeks, we were 26 young Quakers from all across uh, North America, um, the UK, Northern Ireland, Ireland, and other places in Europe, um, and um, there were five of us young friends from Canada, and three older mentors. We traveled around the UK and Northern Ireland, and we worshipped at historic Quaker sites. We visited meetings. We learned about Quaker history and Quaker process, and through this traveling and worshipping and discerning together um, in a community of young friends from so many different cultures and experiences, this was um, one of the first times I started to learn about the diversity within Quakerism and my faith was deepened by the companionship of other young friends who were on the same journey as I was, asking the same kinds of questions um, and having the same kinds of doubts. 
And this really gave me a sense of belonging and community. And also the pilgrimage introduced me to Quaker service work. We learned about Elizabeth Fry. We visited different Quaker centers that were doing conflict resolution work. Um, I remember in Northern Ireland, we visited a small Quaker house up on a hill where I think there were different paths that led to the house and people from different sides of the conflict could, could come together and meet there in a neutral space. So being able to visit and see in real life these places really opened up my eyes to service work guided by faith. And I remember being really inspired, learning about past Quaker activism and seeing in current day the changes that these Quaker groups were able to help come about in their communities. Um, what impacted you about uh, the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage, QYP? <laughs> Yeah, for me, I think thinking about, um, so the pilgrimage was organized, it's one of the functions that the Friends World Committee for Consultation carries out. And so we really were able to engage with a world body of friends beyond, you know, this little bubble of Canadian friends that we both, I think, found so special. And for me, it was it was also really special because um, I was also joined by my cousin, Ellen Cheatley, on the pilgrimage. And, you know, deepening that friendship, deepening the friendship with other the other young Young friends that I met for the first time on that pilgrimage those are friendships that still you know are part of my faith journey today and even through this pandemic it's been amazing to to worship with those friends in you know very far away places but now that we have zoom worship it's been great to connect in that way um, and similarly um, QIP strengthened my faith as a as a Quaker and um, sort of helped me understand really the the meaning of worship in um, for my Quaker faith and prioritizing long periods of silent worship every day for over a, for a, just about a month was actually a very you know um, phenomenal experience as a young friend and especially also the environment in which we are able to worship and learning about the history of friends uh, at Pendle Hill at Swarthmore Hall in meeting houses that had hosted worshiping friends from the very beginning of our tradition, you know, across 1652 country and, and places I'd, I'd heard people, you know, I'd heard my Grammy talk about all these different places and then I was able to visit. Um, opened my eyes to the history of our, our of our faith and to the history of service in our faith as well and and how those are two very interlinked things. So I'm going to put a question in the in the chat now, um, actually about how, you know, reflecting on what you've heard from Christina and I and how formative these experiences were. Um, the question is in the chat now. Um, and it's how do you support and nurture young friends in developing their faith by connecting with other young Quakers and following where the light leads them in service of a more peaceful world. And so I just thought we 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 I thought that we would put some questions in the chat and encourage you to just interact in a different way. Sometimes Zoom can be a little bit, you know, tiring to listen to people just talking. So just a different form of interaction for different styles of learners. Just ignore it if you find it distracting, but feel free to jump in there and maybe we'll have a chance to come back and look at that after afterwards. Um, so yeah, I guess that takes us from sort of an early part to like a, from a foundation to wanting to hear more about Christina. How did your experiences as a Quaker really shape other experiences in your life? Um, yeah, I, well, I also I look forward to seeing um, people's uh, responses to our question in the chat while we're while we keep talking. But um, so Rachel and I, we met again at Pearson College where we overlapped for a year. And it was really nice to have you there, um, having had this um, the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage experience together. Um, and knowing that I could always go to you, that we had this shared experience from before. It was really special to be there with you. Um, and also, um, I remember going to, during that time, going to Victoria Monthly Meeting a couple of times, which helped me continue to feel connected with Quakerism, even so far from home. Um, 
after Pearson, I studied at College of the Atlantic in Maine. And during that time, I was on Canadian Yearly Meetings Education and Outreach Committee, and later was one of the co-clerks of Canadian Young Friends Yearly Meeting. And being part of both of those groups helped me to continue to feel grounded in my faith. And I learned a lot about Quaker process and the value of decision-making and discernment grounded in faith. Um, and so I'm really grateful for um, being able to have both of those experiences on the uh, Education Outreach Committee, which I think um, is the transformation from HAMAC, um, and, uh, and being a more central part of Canadian Young Friends Yearly Meeting too. In my last year of university, I was studying here in Bolivia, and I was happy and grateful to receive the support of Canadian Yearly Meeting to attend the Friends World Committee for Consultation, FWCC, World Plenary here, or not here, but close to here, in PSAC, Peru, which I attended with Steve Fick, as, um, and we were the two Canadian representatives. It was incredible to meet friends from all over the world. There were over 60 young friends there, which that was incredible too. That was, um, I don't think I had up until then been in a gathering of young friends that large. So um, it was a wonderful to worship with that many young friends. And um, that experience at the World Plenary was um, a time when my understanding of faith translation deepened. I practiced listening deeply to friends with different experiences of Quakerism. And for me, faith translation means practicing listening, trying to understand beyond the language that we use and to try to find common ground through, um, through this type of listening with people who have different experiences and beliefs. And it's a practice that's helped me in lots of other areas of my life as well. All of these experiences in Quakerism taught me to be open to leadings and to listen deeply to the ways of the spirit, even when it may surprise me, most often when it does surprise me. So I want to share a story about this, um, about, about the ways that I've experienced this. In 2016, I visited my mom in Labrador for about five months. And I was very privileged to be a guest on the land where Inu, Inu Métis and, uh, and um, uh, communities live. I was there just when Harvard University published a study showing that the Muskrat Falls hydroelectric dam would leach methylmercury into the Churchill River where the reservoir, um, when the reservoir of the dam was to be flooded. And in Labrador, the Churchill River is essential for Inuit, Inu Métis, and settler communities as a source of food. And with methylmercury in the water, their food would be poisoned. And so many traditions would be lost. Of course, there had been um, many, many land protectors who had been uh, mobilizing and protesting against Muskrat Falls for many years. And when I was there in 2016, there was um, things sort of came to a head with this Harvard study that something so official confirmed what so many land protectors have been saying for so many years. And so after the study was published, I saw that there was going to be a march in Goose Bay. And I'm not someone who would normally go to a march in a town where I'm a visitor and I barely know anyone, but something inside me, the spirit, um, whispered, you should go. So I would, so I went and I, I would usually go to marches with friends or family, marches that I've gone to in the past. Um, but this time I went and I was there alone and I met, I, I saw a young woman live streaming on her phone to social media. So I stuck with her and her name is Andrea Anderson. She's a young enough woman. And um, I marched with her and after about 15 minutes of walking in silence, I asked Andrea if it was meant to be a silent march. And she said, oh no, no, we're just marching. And if um, for most people, it's their first time coming to a protest because the, this Harvard study had really sparked um, sparked this urgency to, to march for the first time in a lot of people. And I was very surprised when I found myself saying, 
oh, we should lead some chants. And <laughs> especially as a Quaker, being comfortable with silence, um, here I was saying, oh, we should make some more noise. Um, but uh, I surprised myself because I had never led protest chants before in my life. But this was one of the first times in what would become a three-week movement where I felt the spirit leading me to offer myself to fill holes, gaps, to do small things that would support these communities in their search for justice. So much to my surprise, I found myself checking with Andrea to see if she thought that chanting would work. And she kindly told me um, that chanting may be a bit beyond what folks would humor or be up for, but, um, but she said we should try it out anyway. So we ended up convincing some of the women who were marching around us to respond to the call out. We would call out, tell me what democracy looks like. And they would respond, this is what democracy looks like. Um, so we tried that and Andrew was right. We were met mostly with chuckles and some very cautious responses to the chant. Um, but it was the beginning of our, of our friendship and, and collaboration over the next few weeks. And over those next few weeks, land protectors mobilized to block the gates to the construction site. The gates to the construction site are about, 30, about a 30 minute drive from Goose Bay. And land protectors would arrive at the gates around five in the morning and stay all day blocking the gates until eventually there were people staying there 24 seven, setting up Labrador tents, setting up fires. It was the beginning of October. And so it was still very cold. Um, and but by not letting workers in or out, the construction of the dam had to be paused. And this protest site became a communal space where for maybe the first time, Inu, Inuit, Métis and settlers, communities that are usually in conflict, conflict with each other, came together. And there were sometimes up to 200 people um, gathered there to protect the river. And in the same way I felt led by the spirit to attend that first march, I felt led to keep showing up. So um, hundreds of police were flown in in reaction to the land protectors mobilizations. And uh, Andrea and I started trying the chant thing again at the gates and this time it stuck. <laughs> and it was, we found that it was a peaceful way for us to channel our energy. And to my surprise, and I was very happy to see this a few days at later, um, after doing different types of chants, people, um, land protectors started leading the chants themselves and they would, um, when energies needed to be boosted, um, they would start using this method. Um, and so I offered myself to Andrea and to other leaders, offering to support them in any behind the scenes ways they needed. And maybe it was because I was an outsider without any history there, with, um, but with introductions from Andrea and people like my friend and mentor and a new elder, Elizabeth Panashaway, who was a great friend of Betty Peterson's, I began to be approached to be an in-between person and to share information between community leaders. And there were also many other actions and rallies taking place with no media coverage. So I was asked to liaison with the press as more and more media outlets started arriving to cover the protests. And Andrea recognized that if people were gonna pay attention, then we had to humanize the land protectors. So we ended up interviewing land protectors and sharing their stories on social media. And um, there were also three young hunger strikers, Billy Gautier, Delilah Saunders, and Jerry Kohlmeister, who went to Ottawa. And I remember at the time reaching out to friends in Ottawa. Um, and they went to Ottawa to talk to the government. And the day before going, they realized that there was no press release to announce their arrival or let people know they were going. Um, and a voice inside me spoke up and I found myself volunteering to draft a press, draft a press release. I opened myself to the spirit and was led to serve in ways that I had never imagined myself capable of before. But throughout this, I knew that I wasn't alone. I could feel the spirit guiding me and guiding all of the land protectors who kept showing up for justice and for peace. And unfortunately, the Muscat Falls 
dam continued to be built and the reservoir has been flooded and the protest site where so many connections um, and community were made, uh, it's empty. I look back at this time and sometimes it's hard to believe that any of it really happened, but I do clearly remember how held in the light I felt, how I felt held up by the support of CFSE during that time. Um, I definitely had some frantic uh, <laughs> messages with members of CFSE, you Rachel included, um, while all of these things were developing. And um, I remember the support of friends in different cities that I had reached out to and who were also reaching out to me. So throughout this, my Quaker faith, my Quaker community, my and my non-Quaker community um, helped me to stay grounded and to feel like I could offer myself to serve through filling holes, being a witness, helping to bring people together in a Quaker way through listening. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, this was one of my first experiences outside of the Quaker world when I felt that my Quaker identity was really coming into play with my service. And I'm curious about your experience, Rachel, in Qu the Quaker service world and how your experience um, in Quaker service began. And yeah, if you can share a little, that would be great. Well, thanks, Christina, for sharing your stories. And I think uh, I, I remember that time very vividly and feeling grateful for our friendship um, through then and the friendship, capital F and small f, that can then help support each other in these different times. Um, so for me, when I left Pearson College, um, where we were at school together, I, you know, straight out of high school, I thought, well, I didn't think, I, my dad forwarded me an email um, saying that CFSC was looking for interns. And I thought, oh, there's no way I could do that. But I was encouraged to apply and I did. And I remember writing in my application that I was looking um, for a work that I felt could align with my values. And of course, at, um, you know, then and still now, I felt like CFSC really was the, the, that home place for me, um, where I could find work experiences that also fed my spirit and back and forth. And I was really fortunate to start my internship in BC and uh, learn from former program staff working on jails and justice, Meredith Egan, who opened my eyes to the power of restorative justice. And then I carried on to learn from staff in Toronto and actually started with a week at work camp at Camp Nikonis, um, which I saw in the chat was coming up a few times. Thanks, Pete and Jen. Um, a great place to, to nourish young friends, absolutely. And I was very grateful that part of my internship was, was going to camp. <laughs> um, as a West Coast kid, that wasn't um, something I had grown up with, but I was really happy to finally uh, see that beautiful place. And so I'm very grateful for the friends who continue to uphold Camp Nikonis as a space for young friends. Um, while in Toronto, uh, I was mentored by Jane Ryan Smith and Jen Preston. And also I, uh, I was diving into learning about conscientious objectors and about indigenous rights at the intersection with environmental justice. And while I was an, in, in, while I was an intern, <laughs> I was blessed to be taken in um, by the late Phyllis Fisher. And I stayed in her home over that summer and uh, many of you will remember Phyllis's lifetime of service and her practical manner and approach to making a positive difference in the world. And I, I just loved hearing her stories about her work with alongside my, my grandmother um, that they did at Grassy Narrows um, way back in the 70s. And I, I would say I was astonished, but it's really not so astonishing um, that I was continuing that work um, and CFSC continues to connect with Grassy Narrows. And I believe there's actually an online rally coming up next week. So to think about the work of CFSC spanning 90 years, but also spanning the last 50 years um, with one community and supporting that community in their struggle for, for justice and fighting the mercury poisoning. Then, and that's again, you know, then connected to what Christina was just telling us about on the East Coast. So after my internship, I remained connected with CFS3, with CFSC through um, university and connecting in bits and pieces over the years. And then I was, through my uh, interactions with CFSC, I was encouraged to 
um, work as a program assistant for the Quaker United Nations office in New York. And CUNO has offices at the UN in both New York and Geneva. And there I learned about how to support peace building and prevention of violent conflict through what uh, we call quiet diplomacy at Quaker House. And um, was also fortunate there to work with Canadian friend, Sarah Clark, um, who some of you might know from Ottawa, uh, learning about really kind of how to speak what I would call like the UN language or the UN lingo, um, but then translating that into, um, you know, connections just as human beings at the at the Quaker House in New York. So friends there, similar to many cities around the world, have a Quaker House, which is a property near the UN. Um, and there, the work that we did was really about not the end goals, but about the ways that we did the work together. And so really about relationship building. And one of the ways that this happened was we would have all kinds of folks come from the UN to have lunch at Quaker House. And it's this beautiful, very homey place um, where the director lives with his family and there's a garden out back. Um, so a very different environment than the UN. And we'd, we'd serve lunch. That was one of my jobs as a program assistant would be to get the lunch ready and serve the ambassadors and you know make everyone feel comfortable and help with their coats. Um, but then you'd have ambassadors balancing and juggling their, their lunch and their juice on their lap because it's a small homey place. We didn't have a big dining room. Um, but at the same time as, you know, right beside them would be some grassroots peace builder or some other um, young person maybe who would also be balancing and juggling their lunch or, or whatever it might be. And they're getting to know each other just as humans. Um, just as people having lunch together in a nice living room, as opposed to people behind a fancy nameplate in the UN setting. Um, and so I think that illustrates um, how friends work internationally and in, in all ways at all levels is looking for how we can connect um, just as, as people, as opposed to these, these big fancy titles. And uh, another little snippet of a, of a story that I would share from learning to work in that way, in that environment would be, I was um, one year working with Jen Preston at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And I looked across the hall of the UN building where we were in this big conference room. And I could see um, some Indigenous leaders had entered the room wearing regalia that I recognized from the North Coast of BC. I didn't recognize who they were, but I recognized the style. And so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll go over and introduce myself because I'd spent some time living in uh, Northern BC. And so I, I you know, went over and it, we did end up having some people in common. So we got to chatting and then, then I invited them over for lunch at Quaker House because they were new to the UN. They had no idea what they were doing. They'd been getting lost. And so we had, we had lunch in the garden together and I ended up helping them out. That's one of the things that CFSC does in these international forums is just helping with the basic logistics of supporting indigenous people who are advocating for their rights in these big forums, but who might not have had the experience of doing international advocacy before. So things like helping an elderly uh, hereditary chief have a, a wheelchair to be able to move through the UN, um, helping them print their statements, very basic things like that, that can really make all the difference in having your, your voice heard. And that, um, that you know, for a very easy, friendly first connection has then led to continued um, connection with, with those folks and um, even to uh, one of them is a hereditary chief from the Wet'suwet'en and so continued allyship on that work today and supporting them in their international advocacy and I've been fortunate to be invited to their territories to to you know translate what we were doing in New York together to how that can be helpful as their struggle um, as land defenders continues. So that was some of my work in New York and some of my work in Toronto. And I came back to work at CFSC um, to help carry programs forward. And really I've, I've been so blessed to be connected with Quaker work in every single way throughout my entire professional life. And I, I can't say thank you enough to all of each and every one of you who in your own way I know has supported that. Um, and so when I came back to, to Canada after working in New York, I was hosted, um, I think I saw Monica join. I was hosted in Monica's home in Toronto. 
um, and continued working closely with Jen Preston, bridging my knowledge of, of the UN and working on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, work in Kenda and again linking using that that language that I had learned to speak um, at the UN and able I was able to actually help secure a statement from the Secretary General at the time um, Ban Ki-moon for the closing of Kenda's Truth and Reconciliation Commission and this was kind of a funny like you know we tried getting this statement for months and months and it only came together at the very last minute I remember I was actually having dinner with a friend and I got this call and I had to step into the bathroom of the restaurant because it was so noisy and it was the office of the secretary general being like uh, we have your statement would you like it for tomorrow and I was like oh yeah we definitely need that <laughs> um, but just you know trying to and and that came about because again of a connection that I'd built with a young woman and and getting to know her and then we were able to support each other so it was really all about those human pieces within these big systems then that come together in making our service work a reality. And I just want to plug um, now, uh, friends, many of you might be familiar with the work of CFSC on implementing the UN Declaration in Canada. And we know that um, Bill C-15 is going through the government right now. And as a faith body, it's our responsibility as friends to um, follow through on the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to support the implementation of this um, very important uh, UN declaration in Canada. So Kira, I think is gonna help us by popping um, some resources for that into the chat, but if she doesn't, I will get to it later. So no worries on that. Um, you can also find that on the CFSC website, quakerservice.ca, as well as um, the declarationcoalition.ca, I think. Um, as well as the faith in the declaration, which is faith bodies who are working towards the implementation of the declaration in Canada. Um, so that's my, my Quaker service work. And I then uh, moved to working directly with indigenous governance organizations at the federal level, as well as at the provincial level uh, for a few years. And now I'm taking a break and, and working on my master's in human geography. Um, and speaking of taking a break, you've been listening to us talk far too long now. Um, so Christina is going to put on some music for us from Bolivia. Thank you, Christina. And when you hear the music end, um, that will be the end of our break, just a few minutes. So um, take care of your health needs and join us in a little dance if you want to. And we'll be back in a couple minutes. And we'll come to yeah. questions after that. Thanks. It's about, yeah, it's about three minutes. So here we go. It's not loud enough. Okay. No, still not good. Okay. Wait. Oh, okay. I did not share yet. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, 
Okay, we can so we can start to come back. If you've taken a little break, if you're somewhere else in the room, come back. <laughs> um, I'll give a few seconds. Um, we're gonna put another question in the chat. Thank you for everyone who um, commented. I look forward to reading all of those comments a little bit later. And hopefully, we also had the idea that that could sort of be like a like a brainstorm um, for people to share ideas too. So I look forward to reading those. And so now I'm going to put another question in the chat. And um, when Rachel and I were preparing this, we reflected on how there are so many Quaker writings and traditions that have inspired both of us on our service journey. So I'm going to put the question in the chat. And if there is um, a, writing, a Quaker writing or tradition that inspires your journey and service, and um, please share it. And uh, we also wanted to mention that service can be um, have a lot of different definitions for everyone. Um, it can be any type of action, however you feel that it is. Um, service. So I'll share um, one now and I'll put it in the chat too to start things off. It's advice and query number seven. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just putting it in the chat. Um, oh, here I go. Great. Um, and so this, this advice and query has inspired me to be open to the unexpected and mysterious ways that I can serve. I shared um, some of that before, but it, it's, um, it goes like this. Be aware of the spirit of God at work in the ordinary activities and experience of your daily life. Spiritual learning continues throughout life and often in an unexpected ways. There is inspiration to be found all around us in the natural world, in the sciences and arts, in our work and friendships, in our sorrows, as well as in our joys. Are you open to new light from whatever source it may come? Do you approach new ideas with discernment? With the work that I'm doing now in Bolivia, this um, advice and query has given me guidance and helped me to welcome new experiences. Um, Rachel, is there a Quaker writing or tradition you've been reflecting on that has been um, helping you during your service work or that has been um, inspiring you? Yeah, this was um, something we were really excited to, to chat with you all about. So we look forward to hearing what you have to add as well, because there's just so many, right? I think both of us in, in thinking about this and talking about it in preparation for this had a really hard time sort of narrowing down um, really, you know, one thing. Um, and, you know, I feel fortunate to, to reflect on on many of these different pieces but I was trying to think about what could connect with this present moment that we're in um, you know and kind of uh, you know this very strange and, and challenging time for many of us and thinking about the idea of the service work that we do um, and you know how I was describing earlier like the the practice of our work looking not just for you know, what are the goals that we're trying to achieve or what is the, you know, the injustice that we're trying to solve, but how do we actually do that work in the day to day um, and, you know, looking for that light in all as we do the work and, and looking for that in ourselves as well. And so, you know, important to keep in mind that as we're doing this, you know, work to make a better world in the big picture, um, we also have to do that work in our own hearts and in our own homes and in our communities. And it's it's not just the, you know, that big picture policy or advocacy stuff that we're doing. It's the day to day, how we're doing that for our, ourselves and for our families and, and people around us, especially when we're sort of stuck at home and, and not doing the work we might be used to doing. So as I was reflecting on that, I was thinking about um, Caroline Fox and this um, quotation that's, I'll, I'll pop it in the chat now. Um, and I'm seeing some, some lovely things coming in. Um, 
And so this is a writing from Caroline Fox and she was only 21. And I thought that this also connected with a the theme of our, our chat this evening about young friends and remembering that um, young friends really were the founders of Quakerism. And um, in many ways, some of those voices, you know, it, it's not like a special interest group. And I think that's one of the things that's so beautiful about friends is that we don't, um, you know, really subscribe to that kind of, um, oh, well, you're older, so you must be wiser or something, but being open to that um, at all ages. And I think that shines through in this quotation, um, which I guess I'll read. Um, the first gleam of light, the first cold light of morning, which gave promise of day with its noontide glories, dawned on me one day at meeting when I had been meditating on my state in great depression. I seemed to hear the words articulated in my spirit, live up to the light thou hast and more will be granted thee. And it goes on. Um, and just that message, live up to the light thou hast and more will be granted thee. And as we go about our service work um, and our daily lives thinking about how can I live up to the light that I have within me um, today and every day. So that's, um, that's about it from us, um, but we would love to hear um, from you all and would like to open it up now for some questions. So you can feel free to just unmute yourself or um, now we are going to take a look more, keep an eye more on the chat, um, but feel free to just unmute yourself and jump in with any, any questions for us. Caroline, I was thinking about the song um, and thinking of you singing it actually as I was sharing it. So thanks for noting that in the chat. And it's great. The, okay. it's great to see. Um, I, I'm really enjoying seeing the comments from everyone in the chat. I look forward to um, looking up these, uh, the ones that I haven't read yet for future inspiration. And Virginia, you're very right. Part of the inspiration for sharing this um, quotation today came from the end of that, that pamphlet on um, uh, from Open to New Light from the SPG lecture um, in the song. And looking at the, going back to looking at the ideas around supporting young friends, so many great suggestions on how we can um, connect young friends with, with gatherings and do that sharing. If you have a question, you can raise your hand or just unmute. Hi, maybe it would be more helpful if I just spoke to what I tried to write in the chat just now. I just didn't want to make it as simple as saying, well, how do you keep hope going? I, you know, it's not that. And I, I know it's all, it, it's connected with leading and, and just keeping in touch with spirit and moving. But it, it, it discourages me and you're a lot younger than I am. So I'm wondering how you're handling it. That the grassy narrows thing for an example has gone on so long and friends have been involved right from the very beginning in exposing it. And Barry Thomas was one of the scientists that exposed it. And you said, we're, we've been working on it all this time. And here we are, it, it's, it's beyond outrageous that it hasn't been taken care of. And uh, so, I mean, I don't mean to get onto that issue. I'm just saying spiritually or in terms of Quaker faith, where are you at on that kind of issue? Thanks, Margaret. That's a um, that's a really challenging question. I know. <laughs> it's and it's a really good one. You're getting to the you're getting to the heart of it, right? And um, Christine, I don't know. Do you want to take a go first, or should I? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, for me, um, so how do I maintain hope? How do I keep hope? Um, I think a lot for me, it's it's easy for me to become overwhelmed, especially with environmental, um, the environmental situation of the world. It's really easy to become overwhelmed, and I um, 
I have definitely gone to places, gone to places within myself where I do, I do, I have felt hopeless. Um, and things that help to ground me is are um, the connections that I have with other people. I think um, yep. the, um, I, I think that's, that's part of how hope is generated for me is through seeing love and seeing uh, people helping each other and being in community. Um, and those are things that really ground me when I am feeling hopeless, hopeless or a feeling um, that there's not a way forward. Um, and going back to those connections and, and memories are really helpful for me. Yeah, Chris, what Christina shared there, I think for, for me, like even doing something like this and reconnecting um, with, you know, a, another young friend and seeing all of your faces on the screen, there's a reason we're all here. And, and part of that reason is that we, we share a faith. Mm -hmm. And at the core of that is worship, right? And so I think at times, um, especially working on something like you, you know, so rightly notice like the grassy narrows issue and, and so many issues around um, environmental justice, indigenous rights. These are struggles that have been ongoing since well before I even arrived on the planet. And how could I think that I would have anything to do with that? Um, mm -hmm. And then, but coming back to, I think what makes our work different as friends is coming back to that place of worship mm -hmm. and settling down into that place that is so much bigger than any one of us, but that's, that's us together. Um, that is, I think for me, what makes my work with friends different than any other work that I've done in, uh, in advocacy on indigenous rights, working with friends is different in the way that it's done and the place where it comes from. Um, so for me, it's not, um, that's not sort of like a naive hope no. that's that's a faith and i think that's different than hope mm -hmm. in many ways thanks a lot both yeah. of you. thank you for the question yeah yeah thank you i'd like to add in that um recently i took a short three session class through pendle hill called the inner guide versus the inner critic and the teacher made this wonderful point that our inner critic, which we originally acquired when we were little as a way of helping us operate with the social mores and expectations of our parents. So it had a big safety role, but it, it can't run our lives when we're adults. So growing up means learning how to tell the inner critic to either completely shut up or sit in the back seat that you're the driver of the bus. And she characterizes the inner critic as being loud and tapping into our doubt and our discouragement and being repetitive. And so it's very easy to hear it, but the inner guide is quiet and we need silence to hear it. And we need to know that we probably will only hear one small step. And that's so ties to me about waiting patiently for a way to open, um, that we may not see the whole path laid out, but our job is to take the next small step. Uh, I just found that very helpful um, and it does seem to me that in many ways, you two have been telling stories about doing just that, which I appreciate that you've done. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Carolyn. Yeah, that, that one small step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm looking through all the faces on the chat. It's just, it really fills my heart to see all of you. I, I, I'm so grateful to, to all of you and the different roles that you've yeah, supported us. Uh, about hope, uh, this is Maida Fellini from Halifax. Um, Mr. Rogers, who brought up my children, <laughs> Uh, said, look for the helpers. When people are down, he said, look for the helpers. And a, a helper was uh, honored in the newspaper this morning. He was a man who 
looked out his window and he saw a deer struggling on the ice. The, the deer was in the water but couldn't get up on the ice in the lake. Mm -hmm. So he took a canoe out and a strap and he went, pushed his canoe along the ice to where the deer was. And it was not easy, <laughs> but he managed to lift the deer into his canoe <laughs> while the deer struggled against him, of course, and kicked him. But, and he pulled the canoe back to the land and he lifted the deer out. And, uh, and then he went in the house to, because his presence was disturbing the deer. The deer was afraid of him. So he watched and the deer stayed there for a while, just stood there on the shore. And then after a while, she gained confidence and she went leaping away into the woods. And well, that's just one deer it, and it doesn't save the world, but it's like the little boy who threw starfish back into the ocean and his father said, look, you're not going to be able to throw all the starfish that are drying out on the shore. There, you know, there are hundreds of them. And, and he said, the little boy said, well, it matters to that starfish. So I think we have to take that there's always this conflict between helping and destroying, and we have to uh, make sure we're on the side of the helpers and support other helpers like Christine and Rachel and, and uh, do what we can to support the, um, the positive. Thanks for sharing that, Mabel. Rachel, Monica Waltersfield, it's so lovely to see you. And I know how hard you've worked over the years. But I think one of the, the points that I wondered if you could elaborate on is, um, you, you alluded to it, but when people go to the UN, how much work it really is. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know anything about that, do you? How much work it is. Yeah. Monica's supported us for many years in the work but, of the Quaker Indigenous Rights Committee at the UN, for friends who might not know. Carry on. But um, the point being that as you make that commitment, um, and as Jen makes that commitment each year, I think reminding yourself, I'm reminded as I watched you work there, how your input is could be the tiniest, teeniest little thing, like a smile, or it could be changing, trying to organize people so that they're a group rather than one person, because as we know at the UN, the one person thing doesn't quite work. But if you could elaborate what sustained you as you did that kind of, what I call knitting together the, the, the loops of this vast organization, and I often ask Jen about this all the time, what sustains her? And I wanted to know, both of you, what sustains you as you do this kind of work that you are giving most of the time rather than receiving? Hmm. Thanks, Monica. That's a great question and a good one for reflection. Two things first um, jump to my mind around and what you're describing about the work at the UN and when we're in these big conferences. So every year um, CFSC goes to attend the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, as well as other forums and other UN meetings. Um, and then, of course, we do have Quaker representatives at the UN um, through the Quaker UN offices. And when we're in those um, usually about two week long meetings or the uh, you know meetings in Geneva that Jen also travels to, they're quite intense. And so it's from you know breakfast meetings starting at 7.30 in the morning um, at a, a country's mission um, to then going into the UN hall for meetings 
um, you know, morning meetings all through the day and then afternoon meetings and you have, you know, special events at lunchtime and then you have special events over dinner time and then you have evening debriefing meetings. So it's really quite the marathon stretch of every day um, being quite a lot of work as, as Monica was alluding to. And I think there's, like I said, two things for me that um, in that very particular environment, what sustains me is first of all, the um, the friendships and the relationships that I think we alluded to throughout. And I think about um, the way that those, you know, just getting to know the same people year after year who, who do this work of, um, I think about it as in some ways amplifying the voices of people who come to the UN to use that forum to speak. So like I was sharing the story of um, chiefs from Northern BC, hereditary leaders coming to share their concerns about a pipeline um, or a natural gas refinery being you know, proposed on their territories. Um, but they, you know, they didn't have any clue how to like really where to start. And so those, the friendship that starts is maybe helping someone then you know turns into just that a friendship where you're you know sharing jokes and and having fun in between all the the little moments of when you can in between the moments of, of serious work um and and then the other thing i think is it kind of comes back to that other question around hope um about sustaining oneself through this through this long work and really, I, I don't actually have an answer because I also get really tired um, and I'm just, you know, we're all just humans and it's very exhausting sometimes. And sometimes you feel like everything went wrong and you you couldn't do the right thing in that in that moment. And so it's not all, you know, yeah, it's not it's not all perfect. Um, but connecting with the like I was sharing about the environment of Quaker House. And for me, I'm a, I'm a geographer, so I'm all about place. And I think about the environment of that room that has been, um, and Quaker Houses all over the world, I think do the same thing. Been home to so many people who might need a home at that moment or who might need to tell their story and have it heard and the power that is then imbued in that physical space because of all the people who, have shared their stories, have shared their experiences in that place, but then who have also worshipped in that place. And that comes back to what's special about Quaker service work is there's that intermeshing of um, spirituality, of faith with the hard work. Um, I don't, I hope that makes sense, but th those physical places carrying all of that. Um, yeah. Christina, what about you? That was a big question. Yeah. Um... I really appreciated the things that you just mentioned. Um, for me, places that I get my strength when I'm, uh, so as the work that I'm doing here in Bolivia, I'm working with a Canadian NGO. I've been working with uh, two different Canadian NGOs since 2016. Um, and a couple of things that really helped me, one is a sense of curiosity and um, that that sort of keeps me going, being curious about the next thing that's going to happen, the next interaction, what could come. I've been working mostly with women's groups here, so um, the very dynamic groups, so uh, making suggestions and seeing what could uh, unfold. Um, also, uh, a sense of humor. Um, that really gets me through not taking things that maybe don't go as planned uh, too personally or taking them so close to heart. So having a sense of humor um, really helps things sort of roll off. Um, and then also um, uh, rely, coming back to faith and to my faith and um, coming back to my spiritual journey and all of the experiences that I shared that really do keep me grounded. And I feel like I can come back to those experiences in moments where I don't feel as strong as um, maybe I need to, to carry on with the work that I'm doing. So um, being able to reconnect, um, that's something that uh, helps me to be strong and, and carry on as well.
Thank you for the good question, Monica. Yeah, thanks. And thank you for um, all your service for friends too over the years. We have a bit more time for questions if anyone would like, or if you would like to share um, what you added into the chat, either on supporting young friends or on uh, Quaker traditions or writings that have sustained you over the years, um, feel free. Um, I don't really want to do either one of those things right now, but I just wanted to say it helps me be strong and carry on as now that I'm old, it helps me enormously to see you two doing this work and to see some of the amazing young people who are just doing, I can't believe how, how competent and informed and educated and compassionate you are. Thank you. And, and uh, I, I, it's, it's really true that you're not, we're not here on the earth for very long. <laughs> and, and, and it feels a lot longer when you're younger and it feels very short when you're old. And if I didn't see young people coming along, you know, I don't, I don't, I mean, I would have a lot more trouble keeping going. So thank you very much. You thanked us a lot, but this really helps us. Thanks. Thank you. There. Thank you, Margaret. And I think, well, I maybe I can speak for both of us, but we definitely have had a lot of amazing role models <laughs> um, in, uh, in helping us in the ways that you mentioned. If you have to leave early, um, no problem. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'm just gonna put a couple things in the chat if you do have to leave early, but um, if you wanted to take a look um, in the chat, we have um, on April 29th, we have a discussion coming up with Dana Ryan Smith, the next in this series. And we also have a little survey um, for how to um, give some feedback on how this all went um, and if there's anything that we could do differently for future sessions because we will be doing this all through this year to celebrate not we but CFSC not you won't hear from us again hopefully <laughs> um, but you can take a look at that survey and give us some feedback for future sessions um, and thank you so feel free to stick around we're not going anywhere but if you do have to leave early of course go ahead <laughs> And I just, um, I just wanted to say for those that don't know, because I think Rachel didn't, um, Rachel may have said this softly, but Rachel's currently serving as the clerk of one of the program committees at CFSC. She's the clerk of the Quaker Indigenous Rights Committee, and she served on CFSC for many years. And Christina is about to come on to CFSC as a CFSC member, if all goes the way we would one would expect it to all go her name is going forward to come on to CFSC this year and I just wanted to say maybe to others if you if there are other um, young adult friends that you know um, who may have that an interest in that type of thing I know that CFSC always we are always blessed with intergenerational membership on CFSC and having people from, uh, from a variety of ages and backgrounds um, is something that totally enriches our work. So I would just remind people of that if there are, and maybe if there's young adults who aren't necessarily part of your meeting anymore because that's what happens as you get older and life goes in other ways and maybe you don't get to meeting for worship very often, but maybe there you still have a connection through family you know, think of them too, because they have lots to offer and um, CFSC would be happy to hear from them. Just, and, oh, so sorry. I just wanted to say one quick thing before, um, before we lose any more friends, if that's okay. Um, I sorry, I panic texted Rachel there because I was losing my internet. So she very graciously did my job for me, um, which is what Rachel did does. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to both of you for being here. And um, it's been such a pleasure to work with you in, in preparation for tonight. Um, and, and something I want to note is that um, 
Rachel and Christina, um, the moment we kind of got on our first Zoom call to talk about this, they immediately started chatting and, and you know, reminiscing and doing all of these things. And um, I kind of forgot that they're living in different hemispheres and haven't seen each other for such a long time. Um, and it was so easy for them to get to that that place. And I, I having heard what you said tonight, I, I think that's um, greatly due to the connection that you, you forged um, on your pilgrimage and, and at school and, and through the various um, Quaker committees and, and such that you've been on together. So um, I can really see how, how strong of a bond that that forms. And um, it's really nice to see and know more about that. And, and hopefully um, other young friends have learned about that as well tonight. Um, so thank you so much for being here and for sharing your, your stories and, and everything with us. Thanks, Kira. It's been great working with you too. A, a, a story that uh, brings together uh, the two themes we've been talking about uh, to this point, the United Nations and youth. And if I may uh, tell a story back when, it must have been 1949 or 50, as a young teenager, I was at a, an assembly at my high school and we had a Canadian diplomat come to see us and his name was Lester Pearson. And he told us this amazing story. Here was 800 kids uh, who have lived in the, 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 the war economy, the war of, of deaths on our block and in our neighborhood. And that was our experience of the world. And suddenly there was this institution that Mike Pearson raved about. He'd been working with it on committees and with people in both Europe and in North America. And it was called the United Nations and all the countries that had been fighting would get together. And I was at the UN on one occasion and I carried around that, rem that memory all the time. Thank you. Thanks, Don. As you were sharing that, I could picture in my mind um, one of the framed pieces of art in the Quaker UN house in, um, in New York. And I'm sure many of you can picture this in your minds as well, even though maybe you haven't been there, but it's one of the, oh, I hope I'm getting the name right, Elias Hicks paintings of a peaceable kingdom. And when we think about the vision for the UN um, and the vision of friends and you know, the service work that we do so often that comes together in my mind with that vision as you were sharing, Don. So thank you for helping me paint that picture in my mind again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that story. That's, um, that's amazing that you were there and uh, that, that there's this connection. <laughs> between that story and something that's had such a large impact on Rachel and my life. That's really, uh, it's really nice to hear about. And when friends ask us what sustains us and what gives us hope, it's, you know, little moments just like that. That's the, you know, the work of spirit and, and those, those mm -hmm. things. So yeah, thank you. And I guess I would say it's just been lovely to hear you talk about the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage, because I just remember so clearly you coming back and, and your enthusiasm talking about it at, at yearly meeting uh, at yearly meeting and as part of FWCC's report. Um, and lovely to hear. I'd forgotten that you'd visited Quaker Cottage in, in Belfast and, and there it is still up on the mountain, still helping families. Um, but the other thing, th I think there are those kind of gatherings like Quaker Youth Pilgrimage um, are just, they just stay with you your whole life. I, I went to the Quaker United Nations summer school um, between high school and, and university. And I have never forgotten how, uh, how much I learned there. In, it was just two weeks, but um, 
to be introduced to all the work of the United Nations um, and to uh, stay in the Quaker Center and, and meet other young friends from all around the world. It's, 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 so I think the more we can facilitate young friends to, to do the, those, those kind of experiences, just do stay with you. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that, Virginia. And I saw that you uh, mentioned in the chat um, and uh, it's, it's, you know, when I, at that age, everything, it seemed like no one else was really paying that much attention. Um, and, and to know that that's a memory that you still hold with you um, about us coming back and being so excited about that experience, that's um, really affirming to know that, um, that that experience sort of radiated beyond just us. Absolutely. And, you know, the service to friends and, you know, being a representative for FWCC, all the different ways that um, Canadian friends have the support and sort of intermix and intermingle, weave this community together to be what it is. Um, Virginia, thank you for that and for supporting us. Uh, you can see that you know, it was much more than three weeks. It's, it's a lifetime of, of connection and, and joy and spirit. Um, this is Maida Fellini again from Halifax. My daughter between junior and senior high school years went to a model United Nations, which was put on at uh, Mount St. Vincent, uh, not Mount St. Vincent, Mount, the, the Mount in Sackville, New Brunswick, the, the university there. And it, it was only a week or a week or two, but she, each person, each high schooler, they're from different high schools in Nova Scotia, each high school took a, was assigned a country to speak for and be representative of. And of course she did her her, her job. It was a South American country. I forget which one it was. And after that, she was really indoctrinated into the world. I mean, it, it gave her a worldview. And she went to Friends World College after that, which gave her four years of worldview, spending a year in, uh, in the States, a year in Jerusalem, and two years in England. And she she's since then, she again, it, it sort of got her so that she could speak and she could carry on. It gave confidence to her in her jobs. And uh, she became head of several centers. One of them was the Women's Center in, in the Tower District in London, England. And, and now she's working for uh, Quakers in Britain in their fundraising. Uh, section and she also has a private uh, counseling practice but it I think the it gave her confidence to to make a difference and and also to be a leader and to go on ahead and and do it do things which uh, she might not otherwise have had the confidence to do so that's one way I think it's hard for young people to do some of these things. My son is a, a teacher and uh, has a wife and a child, and it's very hard for him to have time to get to meetings because Sunday nights he's preparing lessons for his classes Monday, <laughs> Monday morning, but he still considers himself a Quaker and he follows along even though he doesn't always attend meetings. Thanks for sharing that, Maida. And I think what you were mentioning about um, those are, are and and what Rachel and I have shared as well is that are those experiences um, of being in Quaker community from a young age have really um, given us that confidence to continue on our spiritual journeys in service. Um, thanks for sharing that. Yes, thank you so much, Mita, and and thank you for everyone uh, to everyone who who came and shared tonight, um, and to Rachel and Christina again. Um, I know that Rachel and Christina and probably many others have had a long day of Zoom calls. Um, so I I, I will um, 
permission to share their email addresses with everyone if, if anybody does want to um, connect more with them. So I'm going to post that in the chat right now. There we go. Um, and they, um, I'm sure they'd be happy to hear from you if you um, had more questions. Um, but thank you so much again. And I, I do hope that uh, folks will join us on um, April 29th, the last Thursday in April, um, for the part four of this series, which is with Jane O'Ryan Smith, which I'm very excited about. Um, and I'm sure others are excited to hear from. So um, thank you so much for coming. And I, I hope folks have a great evening. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been so nice to see your faces and to know you, you're here supporting us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, all of you. Really, really beautiful to see all of you. Thank you for coming out tonight and do be in touch. Hope to see you in worship soon. Everybody Thanks. take care. Is it over? Am I? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. Thanks, Christina and Rachel. It's nice to hear from you. Nice to see you, Stephen. Can I ask a quick question? Are you going to go? I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you guys have things to do. But. We can, I think we can. Um, yeah, sure. Thanks. We'll, we'll linger. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, it's nice hearing about the experience. Like, I, I went to my first meeting for worship in my 20s. Um, and, and became like pretty into the community since then, but don't have that, you know, that, that being raised in a meeting. And it's, it's really interesting to hear about. Um, I, I'm one of the representatives of uh, CYFYM Canadian Young Friends Yearly Meeting currently. Um, and, and a lot of us are in this kind of position of, of uh, convincement within our 20s. I, I, I know you don't have that experience. Um, so I, I, I was trying to form a question that I thought could get at this, but it's just something that I wanted to raise because it is a really interesting difference. And, and I just was curious if you had any thoughts on that or even just, you know, anything, but I appreciate the time. And it was really lovely hearing from both of you. So thanks. I find, well, for me, I find a lot of inspiration from young friends like you who were not raised in, in a Quaker community. And, um, yeah, I really enjoy sharing in spaces. With, I I really I don't really yeah I really enjoy sharing spaces with young friends that have uh, found Quakerism. I feel like there's um, I get to see the experience through another set of eyes, kind of, um, and it's really exciting to me. And yeah, so I'm really glad that you're in that position um, with Canadian Young Friends Yearly Meeting. Thank you for taking that on. I know, um, I know it can be a lot sometimes, but I really <laughs> appreciate that you're doing that. Yeah, I guess I would just add, um, I think, of course, you know, I feel very fortunate that I was born into a Quaker family, but also um, I don't think it's, like, so coming to Quakerism as a young adult, I also really admire that and I get really excited um, by people, you know, that I meet that have found Quakerism. So I'm really happy that you're here. Um, but I, for myself, I guess being a Quaker, like, it's not something that I, I don't feel like being a Quaker, like, gives me um, answers or is like, this is where you always belong or something. Mm. Um, because I feel like it, uh, I'm always challenging myself to think about um, why I'm a Quaker or what I'm doing. Like, am I a Quaker? Mm. And so I think we keep asking ourselves that question, even though maybe we're born into a Quaker family, but um, at least that's what I feel like Quakerism asks of me is mm. to do that continuing um, like self-reflection and like continued learning, you know, I guess continued revelation and in, in the big picture but you know at the small level I, I don't I, I don't know if I look at that haughty but <laughs> but you know what I mean like I, it's not just because you come at a different stage in mm. your life doesn't mean that we're not all always like arriving again you know and there are times where it like ebbs and flows um, so I'm happy that you're here and thank you for sharing that with us <laughs>